Good morning, everybody. Good morning, everybody. And then that way, everybody in my back row can hear me, right? Good. Yay. Yay. Well, thank you for coming. It's so delightful to see everyone this morning. And if I haven't had a chance to say hello, I will do that during the course of the day. But my name is Susan Thornton, and I'm the CEO of the Cutaneous Lymphoma Foundation. And I probably should stand over here. Um, ah, there we go. <laughs> so just so you all know, we are live streaming around the world this morning, which is really, really exciting. Uh, it's something we added last fall. And what's really great, we only we have an opportunity to do only so many programs around the country, and we go to Canada as well over the course of the year. And so this way, by live streaming, we're, we can bring the show everywhere. So people can just sit at home on their Saturday morning and, uh, and listen to the presentations and, um, and we'll be able to reach them as well. So just wanted to all let you all know that we are live streaming. So if you do ask questions and things like that, we're going to ask that you use the mic so people that are listening from home can hear what you're asking and hear what you're saying and hear the physician's presentations and things like that. And I know a lot of you came from far and wide, and some are more local than others. So for those of you that traveled a long way, thank you for making the effort. And it's really thrilling to see you all here this morning. Um, let's see, I have to go through my, our wonderful program manager in the back here. Hilary Romke actually is responsible for all the logistics and putting all this stuff together and doing all the legwork and making everything happen and making the live stream work. And um, you know, when you have technology, sometimes there's challenges. And, and so she's been doing a great job and pulling everything together. I just get to come up here and look good and say hello. <laughs> That's basically it. Um, so let's see, my morning announcements. Make sure you get your parking vouchers from Hillary so that you can get your parking covered. And we'll be paying for that. And then I talked about the live streaming. Um, so if you, if you want to ask a question and you don't want to do it live, feel free to just write it down and hand it to either myself or Hillary and we can ask your question for you so that you make sure you get your question answered. You know, I know sometimes people, especially because we're live streaming, may not be comfortable um, asking in a, in a bigger audience. So we want to make sure that your question gets answered. So please let us do that. And then uh, lunch will be in the White Rock Room, which is right next door, and it'll be easy to find. You won't get lost, and we'll let you know when we get there. Uh, let's see, I think, that's, I think that's my announcements for the morning. Okay. And we do have a lot of materials in the back. If you, if you don't have copies of, of our patient's guide and all of those things, feel free to take them. We don't like to take them home. So and if you want to take them for family members or for maybe um, you, know, you see a dermatologist in the town that you're in, it's always great to share that with them too. So take extras. We're happy to, um, to spread the wealth around. And then if not, we'll give them to Dr. Wickless and she'll take them back to her office. <laughs> so let's see, let me get rid of some of this stuff here. Now I have all of my papers tossed up there on my day. I, I can't sit still, which is really kind of a problem. And okay. Uh, and I'm a Mac person, so now we have a PC, so I'm going to try to figure out how to do all of my stuff. Good. I need to stay over here in my frame. I can't wander too much. This is really hard for me to <laughs> to stay in one place. Holy mackerel. Okay, so how many of you uh, have been with us for a long time? I know we have a few folks that have been around, LaDawn and Jeff and some people that kind of know our story. Um, but we were, the organization is almost where we are now um, 16 years old, which is really exciting. And we are, um, we're started by a patient, Judy Jones, way back, actually, Judy and I were diagnosed the same year in 1991, which was really kind of amazing. And I didn't get to meet Judy until 2008. 
but Judy was so passionate about trying to find other people that have been diagnosed with cutaneous lymphoma, the same thing that she had been diagnosed. And how many of you in the room uh, had a hard time finding other people that had this disease or have been diagnosed? Yeah. And then trying to explain it to people. And, you know, well, it's not a skin cancer. It's, oh, is it skin cancer? No, it's not a skin cancer, but it's a lymphoma. But then why do you have this issue in the skin? Oh, you go, you do light treatment? Well, are you supposed to stay out of the sun if you have? It's really odd. So, <laughs> yeah. and, then, and then people will say, oh, my gosh, wow, you have cancer. Are you going to lose your hair? Are you going to have chemotherapy? And, Oh my goodness, how do you, where do you start? And then mostly if you're like me, you kind of go, oh, I'm not even going to go there, forget it. Let's, let's just even not even try to describe what we're doing. So Judy was really passionate about connecting with other people, and she actually started the online listserv. It, are, how many of you are on the current online continuous lymphoma listserv online? Is anybody on it? A um, couple people. No, no, there's actually, a, it's called the, we call, call it the listserv. It's actually a peer to peer online, kind of an email. Um, so it's kind of old technology actually, but Judy started it uh, originally before the foundation even, even was a glimmer in her eye as a way to connect with other people. And then she took it upon herself to travel to the medical meetings and to meet and to learn about the disease, which was really unusual, which is where she met Dr. Stuart Lesson, who is also very passionate about uh, helping patients, and he is an expert in cutaneous lymphomas. And he had a, a patient actually pass away from Cesare syndrome, who his wife wanted to do something to benefit patients. So Judith Shea had a little seed money, and Judy Jones was out connecting patients, and Dr. Lesson brought the two Judys together, as our story goes, and the Cutaneous Lymphoma Foundation. Well, actually, originally, we were the Mycosis Fungoides Foundation early on, and then we changed our name a little bit later as we learned more about the science and the disease to understand that, you know, there's a bigger umbrella of cutaneous lymphomas. And so the Cutaneous Lymphoma Foundation was created in 1998, and we've been around ever since. And you know, Judy's passion, and still to this day, is to bring education and support to everybody who's been diagnosed worldwide with this disease. And we do have folks from all over the world. Matter of fact, when we did our live stream this fall, when we did our pilot, we had, uh, I think, folks from 24 states in the US on the live stream and from 18 countries, which was pretty, pretty cool. You know, and I think that there were people everywhere that were with us in the room and participating. It was pretty, pretty awesome. But that really is our mission, and that's why we're here today. And this is what we do, is to bring to you all expert information. Because I think, as many of you probably know, especially if you've been living with the disease for a long time, it's, it's, it's a long-term it's a long -term investment <laughs> that you didn't really want to invest in. But the more that you know and the more that you understand, I think the better informed you as an individual can be to work with your physicians on the right treatments and to decide how best to manage the disease and how best to navigate over the course of a long period of time. And it's, sometimes it's not just the disease itself, it's also some the insurance ramifications. As in this country, we go through a lot of challenges with what's going on in our healthcare system and access to therapies and the drugs and um, but the good news is there's a lot of great research going on and there's a lot of really exciting new therapies that are in the pipeline um, for us which back when I was diagnosed in the early 90s there really wasn't a whole lot available for treatments and uh, what I've what we've seen and what I've been able to watch over the last five years since I've been engaged with the foundation in a formal way uh, has really been the explosion of new therapies and research going on in the field, and it's, it's pretty, pretty exciting. Um, so, as I said, we do these educational forums around the country and in Canada, and I was just sharing with someone, you know, every summer we get together with our team, there's, we, we have, there's five and a half of us. We have a part-time admin person that we just added to the team this year, 
And uh, so we sit down with our with the calendar and with a map, and we look at where we've been and where we haven't been and where we can go and can we go to a new city where we haven't been before. And we do um, five five to seven days like this around the country, and then we do some evening open Q&A programs around the country, and then we uh, do a two-day patient program, which we try to move around the country. This year, our two-day program will be in Chicago in June, and then we're adding a second two-day program uh, in October, which is I'm very excited about because it will be in New York City, and it will be on Saturday and Sunday after the three days of the third World Congress for Cutaneous Lymphomas. So for the third time ever, all of the experts from around the world are getting together to share their research, share their data, share what's going on in their collaborations, and they'll all be together. We're expecting somewhere around 400 researchers and clinicians from around the world. And I couldn't pass up the opportunity to pull in some of those international researchers and uh, share with patients what's really happening from a research perspective. So if you want to come to New York in October, it would be a great opportunity to see a wonderful city and really be able to hear from some of the world's experts on what's happening in, in research and what's going on in continuous lymphomas. So I invite you to come to that. Um, all our programs are free. And I will also say that is because of wonderful support from patients like you, as well as from our corporate sponsors that allow us to do what we do and to bring all of these programs to everybody um, at, at no cost. And, and that's, a, that's kind of a huge thing, and we're really grateful for all of the support from everybody that uh, comes to the table to help us out. And so we also do personal assistance, so if you ever need anything, give us a call, drop us a note. We do our best, we're a small team, but we do our best to try to stay on top of what's happening as far as research uh, resources, you know, outside of if you need copay assistance, what's available. Um, I'll let you all know, and everyone who's in treatment should apply for the T-cell transportation grant that is available through the Lymphoma Research Foundation. It provides $500 every six months to patients that have T-cell lymphoma, which is everyone here. And it's $500, actually it's up to $1,000 a year. So you can get $500 and then six months later you can reapply for a second $500. And it's specifically for transportation, they basically write you a check for $500 and you can use it however you so desire. And right now, sometimes by the end of the year they run, to, they run out of funding. But right now, it's been refunded, and uh, I always encourage folks, you know, even if you have great insurance and you're not, you know, you're not dealing with a lot of uh, co-pays and things like that, but, you know, a little extra $500 if you're going to light treatment three days a week and you're paying a $20 copay or you're paying, you know, it's an hour to get to your therapy, I mean, it just, it just helps. And um, as I said, I, I was diagnosed in 1991, and I have experienced myself personally some of the interesting financial side effects <laughs> of living with this disease for a long time. And you know, having some of these programs available is is really helpful. And I think it, it takes a little bit of that extra stress off your plate um, because I know for me and my experience, the financial component, I, I almost felt like I. I had I dealt with my disease, and then I had to deal with kind of the other pieces of it, and um, and that's not fun. So, and we have all of that information on the website. It's under resources, um, but if you look up the Lymphoma Research Foundation, it's their T cell transportation grant, and I encourage everybody to go ahead and apply. And then if the, if you ever have any questions or you want to just run something by us or you need a, somebody to chat with, give us a call. Um, we're always happy to help in any way that we can. And then our online learning center, I don't know how many folks that have been out on the website and on to the online learning center, uh, but it's really a fabulous, fabulous tool. We have, we take the opportunity when we do some of our programs to videotape, you know, we have a green room with a professional videographer, and we videotape presentations by the clinicians, and they're broken down by specific topics, and we have patient 
uh, videos and a lot of information that answer specific questions and things of that nature. So um, I encourage you to go out and check it out and watch some of the videos. We also upload all of our presentations from our events. And then we also will be uploading the live stream. So sometimes even though you're here today, you may only be able to hear so many things. And, and so to be able to go back and kind of refresh and, and take, a, take your time, to watch something and, and you may hear something that you didn't hear. So that's always available. And again, we'll, we'll be live streaming our events throughout the course of the year and then they will all be on video later. So you can always watch them. And then on our website, you'll see we have a listing of the treatment centers and the, and the clinicians, the experts in the field. And you all are lucky here in Dallas that you've got some great great clinicians here and they're with us today, which is really exciting. You know, uh, not everyone in every part of the country has access to an expert in continuous lymphomas and, you know, it can be very challenging for some folks to find the right physician and to find the right doctors to help them. So we try our best to keep the treatment centers up to date and so if you ever want information on um, other experts in the field, that's always available out there. And then we do also, we've been doing some research funding ourselves. Um, we started our Clarion's Grant Research Program four years ago, three years ago. And uh, this year our Scientific Review Board is very excited. We had so many great applications that we actually funded four grants instead of uh, what we anticipated to fund two. And our research report will come out uh, the end of this month, I think then it'll be up on our website and you can read about the researchers that we've been supporting and the research that they're doing. Um, there's so much great work being done and we're really excited about our ability to be able to support some of those research efforts. And you know, when you think about research, there's a lot of people say, and you may hear in the news, you know, the NIH funding and, and all of that's great research and, and as our government needs to continue to support that, but then there's all these other efforts that are ongoing with individual clinicians and researchers around the world that are looking at a wide variety of different questions in cutaneous lymphoma that we have to answer in order to be able to learn more about the disease or to learn more about how a treatment is working. And so we're really thrilled and proud to be able to support the research and we hope that we'll be able to grow our research uh, program going forward. We um, we're revamping some of our, our clinical components and we're actually now going to have a research advisory, an official research advisory board that is going to be chaired by Dr. Pierluigi Porcu out of Ohio State. He's a hematology oncologist and very committed to research. He actually was uh, one of the clinicians that helped us put together our Clarion's grant program originally. So we're excited to work with him and to look at how the foundation can support research going forward in a way that is really meaningful to bring some valuable information to the field. And then I was speaking to some of you earlier, we were talking about you know, all the things going on. I'm sure you've all heard about the pricing and our, our friends at Valiant and Targretin. It's been all over the news. And, you know, it's, it's really challenging when you start to peel the onion on how things work in our healthcare environment. And we do our best. I spend a lot of time in Washington and as part of a lot of different coalitions that are patient focused and trying to make sure that the patient's voice and the things that we deal with every day are part of what happens in Washington and in the policy arena as well as in the regulatory arena. And um, we can't, you know, we're a small rare disease, but if we work together with some of these other larger coalitions and, and organizations, we can raise the voice collectively. And I get to bring the cutaneous lymphoma perspective to all of these different events. Uh, I'll actually be down in Washington um, for a variety of reasons in March, but uh, we'll be participating at the NIH for Rare Disease Day, uh, the last day of February. And then, uh, and then Tuesday and Wednesday of that day, I'll be joining the rare disease community on Capitol Hill. So we'll be making visits to congressmen and women 
uh, talking about the importance of supporting rare diseases and some of the challenges that we face because a lot of our drugs are very expensive and the co-pays and the challenges with Medicare and Part D that don't cover. And we've got a lot of work to do. So um, I feel it's very important for us to have a voice and to be participatory in what's happening uh, in the legislative and regulatory arena and to bring all of our collective voices together. So we, we do our best um, to, try to, to try to participate and, and to bring your voice to, um, to the advocacy efforts that are ongoing. And then we have a lot of partnerships. You know, we, again, we're a small organization, but we partner with a lot of other organizations out there that uh, to do a lot of other programs and to collaborate. And you know, we work with the physician groups very closely, as well as our partners in the advocacy arena, and along with our corporate partners in the pharmaceutical and therapy world. And it really does, you know, to use a term, it takes a village, <laughs> you know, to really get everything to happen. And, you know, our whole goal is to do what we can to support all of you and uh, to be there for you and to be uh, your voice out there in the world. And then again, of course, thanking our corporate partners because without their support, we wouldn't be able to do what we do. So we're really grateful. And uh, with that, I think that's the end of my little presentation and um, at this point I'm going to turn it over to and I get my act together here so I can look at my agenda. Dr. Ripless is the first one on deck, right? Alex works this morning. Oh, thank you. I had a copy. So it is my honor and pleasure to introduce Dr. Heather Wickless. Some of you may know her because she may be your physician here right at UT Southwestern. And um, it's really, it's really, we're really thrilled to be here. We're thrilled to be back in Dallas and to have the opportunity to, uh, to be with you all today. So I'm going to be quiet and hand it over to Dr. Wickless, I think. Your presentation is on. Oh, you've got it on a stick. Okay. All uh, right. All right. So I'm going to shut this off. It's off. Oh, my guy back there is really helping me out. Yay. Yay. Clicker. And then I will make one more announcement. So I, I have a favor. So for Rare Disease Day, which is February 29th, um, we're going to be doing kind of a social media campaign and raising awareness about rare disease. So I have a few signs here. So if anybody would be interested in taking a picture with us with the rare disease sign that we can then share on Facebook and everything on Rare Disease Day from the Texas contingent, let us know. So maybe, um, maybe after... At the end of the day, we'll do a picture for anybody that wants to participate, and then we can, we'll can we be posting that on Facebook and sharing that with the worldwide rare disease community to show our support. So, yeah. off to you. Well, it's very exciting to be here, and it's, um, it's really a, a treat to have the Cutaneous Lymphoma Foundation um, support a meeting in Dallas. It's been a, a while since we've had a meeting uh, here, and so it's, it's really nice to have a few, one of the regional meetings that's happening um, when there's so few per year. Um, today I'm just going to try and provide a really general overview of cutaneous lymphomas. Um, and um, I wanted to talk about sort of understanding the role of lymphocytes in normal immunity as well as what we know about cutaneous lymphoma. And then what we'll do is kind of go through some of the various types of cutaneous lymphoma, how we make those diagnoses, and just give a really kind of brief overview of some of the <clears throat> medical treatments that we do. Dr. Desai is here, and we're really fortunate to have him. He just moved to Dallas from New York, um, where he was at uh, Memorial Sloan Kettering. And um, I just feel so lucky to be able to collaborate with him um, on treatment of patients. So in general, uh, this is how I explain it, and many of you who uh, are my patients may have heard me explain this uh, this way before, but when white blood cells are born, 
they decide, they're kind of told where to go live in the body. And so some white blood cells decide they're going to live in your lymph nodes. Some white blood cells decide they're going to live in your bloodstream. Other white blood cells are told to live along your GI tract, and other white blood cells are told to live in the skin. And so it's sort of like people. Some live in Dallas, some live in New York, and we can move around, but we tend to go back to our home. And so in cutaneous lymphomas, the home of these white blood cells is in the skin. In fact, there are more white blood cells in our skin than there are in our bloodstream. And sometimes when I tell patients that, they go, oh my gosh, like I didn't know that. Um, but it kind of makes sense if you think about where you're exposed to foreign things. Uh, it's usually not in your bloodstream, it's out here in our skin or potentially along your GI tract. So there's a, um, many, many white blood cells in the GI tract and a lot in your skin. And so um, they used to call this um, skin-associated lymphoid tissue, but um, they, they don't really refer to it that, that anymore. But um, they're basically, we call them skin resident uh, either T cells or B cells. Um, and so what happens is, is that in general, um, there are cells whose job in life is to um, bind foreign materials. It could be allergens, it could be bacteria, it could be a virus. And when they encounter something that they regard as foreign, they go and travel to a lymph node and they start trying to show that um, foreign antigen to any white blood cell who uh, might be excited about it. And when they find that white blood cell, uh, the, those white blood cells know, oddly enough, know where that, that cell that found the foreign particle came from. And so when that, what we call an antigen presenting cell, encounters a T cell in your lymph node, the T cell goes back to where that cell came from. Um, and then it's, some of those cells actually take up residence in your skin and kind of like live there the rest of your life. And that's why actually things like staph infections are often worse in children than grown-ups because we actually acquire more and more white blood cells as we go through life that take up skin residence. That may, may be why that uh, cutaneous lymphomas are more common at, in adulthood than they are in childhood because as adults we have more cutaneous dwelling white blood cells. Um, so with cutaneous lymphomas, those can arise from either T cells or B cells. Now T cells, I'll speak in a broad terms, T cells job in life is to find a uh, cell that may be, uh, has a virus in it or that cell is uh, cancerous and the T cells job in life is to just directly go try and kill those cells. Whereas B cells their job in life is to make antibodies to things. So T cells go and kind of, they're sort of the foot soldiers, they go in there and uh, uh, just kill bad cells. Um, and B cells are more like, I don't know, the, uh, the guys in the airplanes that are just dropping bombs. <laughs> um, so um, the rate of cutaneous lymphomas overall is pretty rare. It's um, one out of 100,000 per year. So basically, that we call that the incidence, but it's basically the annual rate um, of any population is about one out of 100,000 that might develop. So these are very, very rare diseases. Um, the majority of those are from T cells. Um, and the majority of the T cell family of cutaneous lymphomas are mycosis fungoides. One thing a lot of patients ask me is why do I have this lymphoma that's got a really funny name mycosis fungoides, and why is it called that? Um, well, it has to do with the first patient that was ever described with this condition, which was about 220 years ago in France. Um, there was a Frenchman who was sort of the founder of dermatology, if you will, sort of the birthplace of dermatology as a specialty, and they didn't have microscopes back then, and they didn't really know what caused a lot of things. So the way they first started sorting diseases was just based on their appearance. And so, as you may know, if you've had lesions like this on your skin, or know someone who has, or looked on the internet and seen pictures, mycosis fungoides can many times have circular or uh, scaly spots on the skin. And it can sometimes resemble things like ringworm. 
And so the original dermatologists, when they saw this, they said, oh, this must be the my, a mycosis. But they had this patient that had these lesions and then later developed some tumors. So they said, well, this is the mycosis that fungates, which means that it kind of grows like mushrooms later on. And so they didn't know what it was, so they just kind of lumped it in this category because of its clinical appearance, but not really because of its etiology. That wasn't discovered until later. Um, there's some smaller subsets of cutaneous lymphomas uh, called lymphomatoid pap papulosis, another one called anaplastic large cell lymphoma, and um, then Cesare syndrome. Some people kind of link mycosis fungoides and Cesare syndrome. Cesare syndrome is a term we use when there are these same, same kind of white blood cells that might live in the skin, but they're more residing in the bloodstream. Um, and then there's some other very, very, very rare uh, cutaneous lymphomas that are of the T cell type that um, are about 1% overall of the, of the whole. And then um, a smaller group of cutaneous lymphomas <coughs> might arise from the B cells, the um, antibody producing cells, and they refer to those as marginal zone and follicle center cell lymphomas. <clears throat> Later this afternoon when Scott Wickless, um, who actually is my spouse, but did training in cutaneous lymphoma pathology, um, We'll go over kind of why those are named uh, marginal zone and follicle center cell lymphoma. Um, and then there's another B cell uh, lymphoma called diffuse large B cell lymphoma, and that's actually pretty rare. So um, how do we make the diagnosis of someone with cutaneous lymphoma? It's actually not easy. Uh, the average patient may go about six years. Uh, this has been proven in many studies that the average patient that has cutaneous lymphoma may go about six years before they actually are diagnosed with the condition. Um, and so we, a point system was developed by a group of experts in cutaneous lymphoma to try and aid in the diagnosis. As you might imagine, because we have so many normal white blood cells that live in our skin, let's say you have a chronic allergic reaction in your skin or you have a chronic form of irritation because Maybe you're allergic to elastic or you're allergic to nickel, so you get rashes when you're exposed to those things. So a bunch of white blood cells are going to live in the skin, and so it's hard to determine if those are bad white blood cells, like in a lymphoma, or if they're just there doing their normal uh, job. Um, and then infections can also be a, a mimicker of many cutaneous lymphomas. So a point system was developed, and um, in order to make a diagnosis of cutaneous, it's not a perfect algorithm, but it's the only one we have right now. So um, in order to make a diagnosis, we look at um, using uh, points. And if you, now if anyone's uh, patient is um, registered in a database with cutaneous lymphoma, the, uh, in order to uh, include that patient in any database for research, they have to at least meet this diagnostic criteria. So. Um, Basically, what we do is we look at if there's a classic um, cutaneous eruption, and the classic eruption is in more non-sun uh, non exposed areas, so kind of uh, in residency in dermatology, they always say it's in the uh, bathing suit distribution, so kind of in the trunk or on the buttocks um, or areas that are sun protected, um, and that there's some size or shape variation in those lesions, um, and then uh, something called poikiloderma, which is where the skin gets a little bit thin or wrinkly. Um, and then with the histopathology, these T cells, in, this is specifically for the mycosis fungoides, this algorithm. Um, so with these T cells, they abnormally, in normal immunity, the T cells usually reside in the dermis, which is in the collagen layer of the skin. I'll show you a picture uh, later on. But in cutaneous lymphomas, they tend to kind of percolate up into the top epidermal layer, and that's not a normal feature that we see um, in allergic reactions, uh, for instance. And that those cells actually look a little bit atypical. Their, their nucleus, um, which is where the DNA is held, may look a little large or unusual. Um, and then they can also do um, something called clonality studies. I think Scott will go into a little bit more detail about this, but um, what that is is basically where they're looking to see if every T cell looks and recognizes the same thing. And so all the T cells are identical. That can happen sometimes in normal conditions, which is why this actually only gets one point. So let's say you're allergic to nickel. 
you'll probably have a whole bunch of T cells. The T cells are when you have allergies. The T cells are, are, are the ones that are kind of doing that job um, for contact allergies like poison ivy. And so all those T cells are going to be ones that recognize nickel. And all the ones are going to be the ones that recognize poison ivy. So clonality doesn't necessarily mean that you have a lymphoma, but it does tip us a little bit in favor. So if you don't have any logical reason to be having an allergic reaction or to be having an infection where you would have a whole bunch of T cells that only recognize one thing, you just have this rash on your buttock and there's no logical explanation for it. And then we do a test and we see all of those T cells are the same, carbon copies of one another. That means that likely that could be a malignancy because it's one cell that's propagating and begetting new cells. And then there's some other, um, all white blood cells have certain dog tags on their surface that kind of identify who they are. And when you become a cancerous T cell, you sometimes lose some of those normal markers and um, you kind of start to look a little abnormal, not like what normal T cells would show um, on their surface. And so when we see loss of those, that's also a point in favor. But these are minor criteria. The major criteria is that the rash looks like what we would call mycosis fungoides, and that the pathology, oopsie, that the pathology, I'm going in the wrong direction, that the pathology also um, shows uh, the, the classic features. So um, we do biopsies to get to, in order to try and make the diagnosis. So we can't just make the diagnosis clinically. Um, and, but if we get a, a series of these points and we get up to four points, then we can say we're pretty confident this patient has lymph, uh, lymphoma. So um, we do biopsies. Um, but what's really important, and I think this is a big challenge and many times why initially for a patient, we may end up doing three, four, five, six biopsies before we make the diagnosis. Because many times a patient may see a dermatologist or their primary care physician and they go, oh, well, maybe you have some eczema or maybe you have, you know, an allergy to something and, um, or, oh, maybe you have a fungus, whatever. And so they give them some topical steroids many times. And what will happen is um, that, if you recall, one of the diagnostic features was that those T cells were percolating up into the epidermis and those are some of the abnormal ones and the normal ones live down in the dermis. These steroids immediately clear away the cancerous ones, uh, and sometimes all you have left over are some of the abnormal ones. So you're kind of destroying the histopathologic finding. So then we go, well, maybe this isn't, maybe this is just eczema, maybe this isn't uh, a lymphoma. So it can be really, really challenging. Um, so what we try and do is have the patient off of any topical treatments, and that may be why, you know, early on when any of you were diagnosed, someone may have said, just stop everything and just kind of let it be for a month or six weeks and then come back and we'll repeat your biopsy and see if we see those um, findings. So um, here I just show a picture of, um, this is uh, kind of the top of the skin, down below here would be where your fat is, and so this is the this dark purple part is your epidermis and this kind of more pink area is the dermis. Uh, this is a band of the white blood cells, and if you notice, some of them are kind of percolating up uh, into the epidermal layer, and that's the classic feature. This epidermal layer is really just about as thick as a piece of tissue paper, so it's not very thick. It looks like it's big here, but it's really, really thin. And so when you see those white blood cells kind of percolating up here, um, then that's one of the very classic hallmark features of cutaneous lymphoma. Um, so when steroids are used, you can imagine, it doesn't take much for a steroid to penetrate something that's only as, as thick as a piece of tissue paper. And so it'll clear away this classic clinical or, or histopathologic finding, and we have a harder time making the diagnosis because all we have left are some of these cells down here. Um, so how do we stage and how do we, um, like once we make a diagnosis, how do we say, well, this is the stage you are. The stage that a patient has is the stage they present with at the time that they're initially diagnosed. It's just the way that cancer doctors have been doing it since the birth of oncology. And it's so it doesn't matter kind of if like years ago, it just was some little rashes. Today is the day we're officially diagnosing you. This is your stage. And we prognostically look at how a patient might fare over time based on their stage when they present. 
So um, the challenges, um, the, when we see changes in the tumor burden of the patient, um, that can sometimes change the way we might approach the patient. We don't keep treating them like they have maybe minor uh, skin disease when we see uh, more concerning changes happening within the lymphoma, but we prognostically still look at that patient uh, based on what their original stage was. And so part of the staging is the amount of body surface that a patient has. Um, the body, of 1% of the body surface is about the palm and a little bit of the fingers um, of, of the hand, and so that's 1%. And so you'll, you might even see sometimes if you've ever been examined in clinic that your doctor may even be doing this with their hand and they're sometimes measuring. Now really they should be using your hand, um, not their hand, uh, but you know, I guess sometimes you can kind of compare, but you know, you're kind of counting out how many, uh, how much body surface and it's based on percentages. Um, the, the stage one is essentially when someone has less than 10% of their skin surface involved. Uh, a T, uh, this is the tumor stage. The tumor is when it's greater than 10%, we call it a T2, and then T3 is when someone has tumors, and then uh, T4 is when they um, have their red essentially on greater than 80% of their body. So, um, and then we start to put this um, together. So I put circles around here for how um, staging might change and when we start to include other things into the, the staging process. So the most important factor early on in disease is the cutaneous burden of the disease. Um, so, in fact, really some, the experts, many experts still disagree about whether or not this should make someone in the stage two category, but that's, that's neither here nor there at this point. So um, stage one A is if you have less than 10%, stage one B is if you have greater than 10%. Stage two is if you have either of these, but you have a lymph node that feels a little bit abnormal, but doesn't show any signs of the uh, malignancy within it. Um, a stage two B is uh, con considered someone who has tumors, so um, actual lumps or bumps within their skin that are deeper than a centimeter. Uh, stage 3A is when you have red all over, but there's nothing in your blood. Um, but if you have red all over plus something in your blood, you would have a stage 3B, but it would be a very small amount of abnormal cells in the bloodstream. If you have a lot of abnormal cells in your bloodstream, greater than 1,000 of the total T cells, then we call it a 4A1. If it's spread to the lymph nodes and the lymph node is uh, overcome by cancer cells, then someone is in a stage 4A2, and uh, this is when there are metastases elsewhere in the body. So what's a patch? Um, this is sort of what are the initial findings within the skin. So we call them patches or plaques, and a patch is basically just an area that they show the cutaneous lymphoma. Again, we're talking specifically about mycosis fungoides um, that has no elevation or induration. Plaques, on the other hand, um, have is when a patient has cutaneous lesions that either are elevated or indurated, meaning we feel some palpability to the area. You can see, like, if we could touch this photograph, you could sense that there was an elevation there. Um, a tumor is when there is at least a centimeter depth within the lesion, um, and there's evidence that there's a vertical growth. Why do we um, separate things like this into patches, plaques, or tumors? Um, that's because, um, if you recall, in the earliest stages, the white blood cells are just percolating up into the epidermis. But as the disease may advance or progress, those cells start to collect and dive deeper. And as they dive deeper, they get closer to places where they can spread, like blood vessels and <coughs> lymph node or uh, lymphatics and they can then start to hitch a ride. So they're, they're then showing that they aren't just wanting to hang out in their skin, they're maybe wanting to dive deeper down into the body. And so we, that's why it upstages someone. So when someone has um, Cesare syndrome or blood involvement, um, which can happen either as a progression of mycosis fungoides or at the onset of the condition, um, that's when there is a lot of the white blood cells that are abnormal in the bloodstream and it's greater than 1,000 cells or greater than a total, 20% of the total percentage of the lymphocytes that are abnormal. So how do we work up a patient? Um, the first most important step 
is to look at the skin staging of that patient. And that's done by the body surface area that's involved. Then we usually, um, once a patient, it's not recommended that we do a very extensive workup in patients with very early stage disease. If you recall from that uh, um, or algorithm or the um, kind of survival curve that I showed about early stage disease, there's usually not a lot of progression in those patients. So it's not recommended that we do extensive workups in very early stage, like a, t, a stage 1A uh, disease. But once someone becomes a stage 1B, um, and particularly if they get into the stage 2 categories, we many times are doing much more extensive workups to ensure that there's no signs of spread of the lymphoma to other places like lymph nodes or organs. So we do that by checking blood counts, uh, by checking something called a flow cytometry, which is um, essentially where, if you recall, I said all T cells have like um, dog tags on their surface, so they can actually mark all of those dog tags separately um, and then send it through a counter uh, and a computer counts how many uh, of those dog tags, like of the dog tags are on the surface and uh, we can look about um, how many have lost certain markers and stuff like that. So um, that's something called a flow cytometry. And then, of course, looking to see if all the T cells are identical, and that's called a, a clonality study. Um, we do sometimes some radiology uh, workup. We um, can do, for, essentially for a T1 skin, we do just a normal physical exam. Um, some people would say you could do some blood work but, or a chest x-ray, but those things are kind of um, optional. And then uh, anyone that's a stage 1B or higher, we generally are doing a little bit more extensive of a workup. Anytime we do a lymph node biopsy, it's when we feel or on radiology a lymph node that's greater than one and a half centimeters, which is uh, you know, probably about the size of a, a medium-sized marble. And if we feel that and the lymph node is fixed or firm, um, then we really uh, want to get a sample of that entire lymph node to see if it's overtaken by any cancerous cells. And um, bone marrow biopsies may or may not have much utility in this disease, mostly if there's uh, extensive blood involvement. So what do we do to treat cutaneous lymphomas? Well, in the early stages, like stage 1A and stage 1B, all the treatment is directed towards the skin because that's where the disease is residing. Uh, one of the uh, main stays of treatment is something called phototherapy. That's um, sort of like a controlled wavelength of light that specifically reduces T cell um, populations in the skin, specifically the T cells that are involved in cutaneous lymphoma. And um, so, and if you recall, the disease itself generally tends to favor sun protected areas. And there's a uh, a little bit more incidence of these diseases actually in northern latitudes, and there's some thought that perhaps um, the, the sun itself may play a role in uh, control of the disease. Um, and also we know that it can tend to be more aggressive in when someone has darker pigment. Um, and maybe there's some relationship between sun exposure um, and control of the disease. Um, then there's topical chemotherapies that can be applied that penetrate the skin and kill off the abnormal T cells, which are more susceptible to those chemotherapies. Radiation therapy can be utilized. Dr. Desai will uh, go into some detail about that, um, sometimes localized, but sometimes also more generalized. Then topical vitamin A derivatives, such as something called bexerotene. I'm sorry, that's a typo there. Um, and then also topical steroids can be used. We usually don't uh, resort to systemic treatments uh, like um, injectable or oral medications unless the patient shows that they're greater than 10% body surface area. So you can imagine if you have just one spot on your buttock, it's pretty easy to put a cream there or you know do some light treatment there. But if there's really extensive body involvement, it's much harder to kind of put something all over your body. So we may go use oral medications or injectable medications, but phototherapy can still be utilized because when someone goes into a light booth, they're getting light on all of the body surface. 
So phototherapy, again, still tends to be a really uh, favorite there. Um, something called photophoresis can be done. That's where um, blood is taken out. This is only if we find abnormal white blood cells in the bloodstream. Blood can be taken out, and it's essentially like phototherapy for the blood. Photosensitizers are mixed in with the white blood cell part of the blood, and those are run through a machine that exposes those white blood cells to light, and it kills off some of the abnormal white blood cells, which are more susceptible to light, and then it's all infused back into the body. It sounds kind of like hocus pocus, but the thought is that essentially when those white blood cells die from light exposure, they release proteins and particles that may stimulate some of the healthy parts of the immune system to kind of go on the attack from the can to, towards the cancerous cells. So um, when we see, uh, we know that there's some of the abnormal T cells that are in the bloodstream, we can utilize um, something called extracorporeal photophoresis or ECP to try and gain control of those white blood cells. Um, then um, things like interferon alpha, which would essentially um, stimulate, again, the healthy portion of the immune system. Genuleucan diphtotox is only available um, right now on clinical trial. Um, and then oral vitamin A derivatives such as vexerotene, isotretinoin, or acetretin um, that also preferentially kill off some of the abnormal white blood cells. Um, and then something called a histone deacetylase inhibitor, uh, like varinostat, and then a newer uh, agent called romadepsin. And then um, as a last resort, and this is always sort of in our, when we're really, we've gone, we've gone through all of this, and we're sort of like, we don't have a lot left to do. Then we start to pull out <coughs> the big guns, uh, like chemotherapies such as um, gemcitabine, um, or cyclophosphamide, or something CHOP, so, which is a combination uh, chemotherapy. So now we'll move on. I really just kind of focused my T cell talk on mycosis fungoides. Um, I didn't want to uh, like elaborate too much on these two because they're um, relatively rare and it starts to get uh, really confusing. You can imagine that um, as hard as it is for, I think, even anyone suffering with the disease to understand how this disease happens. We actually don't know why or how or the sequence of events that causes one of the T cells to become cancerous. We don't know if that's happening centrally in the lymph node or if it's happening peripherally in the skin. It's still kind of a big, it's one of the big unknowns in cutaneous lymphoma treatment is how it is, what's the first step in, in uh, carcinogenesis of these uh, T cells. So, um, I don't want to go into all these others because it can get really uh, kind of confusing. So um, when I give this lecture uh, in a more extended fashion to like our dermatology residents, their like heads are spinning afterwards because we go into every single subtype and they're like, oh my gosh, I can't keep it straight. So, um, so okay, so now we're going to talk about the B cutaneous B cell lymphomas. These um, are the minority of cutaneous lymphomas. Um, they generally have a pretty good prognosis. Um, the two most common are marginal zone and follicle center cell lymphomas. These, unlike mycosis fungoides, uh, don't usually present as like patches or plaques in the skin. These actually usually present as like pink or purple lumps or bumps, preferentially on the face, but they can happen on the extremities or even on the trunk. Um, and unlike mycosis fungoides, even though they present as a lump or bump, um, they don't tend to be uh, aggressive in their behavior. Um, so one of our first most important steps is um, to not uh, over-treat these patients. And uh, the reason for that is that because these do tend to behave in a very, very uh, non-aggressive fashion overall, um, if someone is not familiar, let's say you're out in the middle of, um, I would say Topeka, Kansas, but I don't think that's really the middle of nowhere, but um, so, you know, in the middle of uh, nowhere in South Dakota, and you don't know anything about lymphoma yourself, and you see a doctor who is not a dermatologist, let's say, uh, a primary care doctor, and they say, oh, well, let's do a biopsy. Oh my gosh, you have a lymphoma. They go, oh, you need to see an oncologist. Maybe you end up seeing an oncologist that doesn't know anything about the behavior of cutaneous lymphomas because they are such rare events. And they go, my gosh, you know, we need to give you this major chemo. Um, 
I'd like to say that never happens, but we see that happen with patients. And so um, we really, really try and protect these patients from overtreatment at the onset of the disease. Um, and we also, one of the most important things in B-cell lymphoma is to make sure they are mostly in the skin and that they're not um, deriving from somewhere else. Um, and the most, the most important part with B-cell lymphoma is, is what type of B-cell lymphoma it is and the extent of skin uh, involvement. So overall, the survival curves, uh, the actuarial curves for B-cell lymphomas um, are quite good. Many, many B-cell lymphomas can arise from cancer-promoting viruses, such as Epstein-Barr virus. That's what you might have heard of as mono. Um, and then also something called Kaposi's sarcoma um, can be involved in some B-cell lymphoma development. Other, uh, there's other theories that if someone carries things like Helicobacter pylori, which is uh, the bacteria that's uh, implicated in uh, stomach ulcers, that that can promote B-cell lymphomas in the GI tract. And sometimes when there's a lymphoma in the GI tract, it can sometimes spread to the skin. And so when we see a patient with certain B-cell lymphomas, we may say, let's make sure you get a, a, you know, a, a scope to make sure that there's nothing uh, coming from a gut lymphoma that's spreading to the skin and it's originally or arising uh, in the skin. So treatment, some, in some B-cell lymphomas, people will just excise. If it's one spot, you can just cut it out. I know it sounds kind of crazy because they're white blood cells and couldn't they spread somewhere else, but in this indolent nature, sometimes they'll just show up as one spot, and, and so treatment uh, excision is sometimes utilized. Other times, radiation is used. That's one of my favorite things because it, it just kind of takes care of it locally, and Dr. Desai will go into that. Um, and then also injections can be done into these lymphomas um, with something that specifically kills B cells uh, called rituximab. And then other things like interferon or steroids, which also kill off the cancerous cells. Um, and then systemic chemotherapies can be used, but that's mostly uh, if someone has, let's say, lumps and bumps of these B cell lymphomas all over their trunk, or all over their face, this can be very disfiguring, and so we may use something more systemic to kind of gain uh, control of the disease, because the local treatment isn't possible. So overall, um, hopefully from this talk, you've gained a sense of how the white blood cells behave in normal behavior, and also uh, how they behave in abnormal circumstances, like cutaneous lymphomas. And uh, we've kind of gone over kind of the two major classes, the T-cell lymphomas and the B-cell lymphomas, and the major um, categories for both of those, and um, then kind of going over some of the treatments. And um, with that, I'm pretty much happy to answer any questions someone might have. And we'll do an open Q&A, too, um, with everybody. OK. This afternoon. OK. Uh, so, right lunch, OK, so. so we'll move on. <laughs> now that your head is spinning. We'll keep the ball rolling. <laughs> <laughs> it's Thank a lot so of information. That was wonderful. Okay, Thank you. you. Thank you very much. So now we're going to bring up Dr. Desai and uh, so excited to have you here in Texas from Pomona's Long County. It's really fabulous. Welcome to the Southwest. It's good. It's good. This is really a good thing for all, for you all down here. And um, love radiation oncology. So just so I've had a lot of radiation treatments for my disease. So this is sort of my prefer my preferred treatment for for cutaneous lymphomas. But um, I think it's really good to understand some of the different <coughs> kinds of therapies and things that work, and and especially for, I think, in this disease, and I speak from my own experience with the radiation, it, it really does work well, and it's, it's different than the radiation that other folks may have for breast cancer, prostate cancer, and things like that. Um, and so it's kind of good to understand <coughs> the options. And so with that, I'll just turn it over to Dr. Desai, because he obviously knows a lot more than I do. <laughs> I wouldn't say that because I, I learned very early that the patient in this, this type of disease knows their disease way better than I'll ever know. Um, but I'm going to turn to a very happy role of mine. I got recruited down here to actually do genitourinary lymphomas, prostate cancer, bladder, kidney, 
got here, realized they didn't really have a big focus in radiation oncology for lymphoma. And Dr. Wickless and the Wickless's had up a great team here for the Kansas City Luminacy, so I was very happy to join. Um, but my role really is like playing tee ball. They set everything up, they put the ball on the tee, and I just basically figure out when to swing and how hard to swing. And, and like Dr. Wickless said, it's all about not over-treating and find the right sequence of therapy. Uh, and, and no other disease do I, I really rely upon them to really tell me what are we looking at, what's the clinical pathologic correlation, um, uh, where are we in this disease state, and how effective should I be, with, or how aggressive should I be. So I have no disclosures. Um, you know, overview of radiation therapy, I'm going to first talk about what it is, how it works, talk about its role in case lymphoma, and then the techniques that we use to apply this disease. Uh, now radiation, um, it's a very broad uh, term. Uh, electromagnetic radiation comes in various forms, light waves, UV waves, TV. Uh, the radiation we're, we're talking about for the therapeutic purposes and the ionizing radiation uh, at the, sorry, I'll use the mouse. Um, basically, on this left side, there's the high energy X rays, basically, and they have to produce <coughs> very particular interactions to produce a therapeutic effect. Otherwise, they're just harmless sort of radio waves and everything else that all is coursing through us. The key aspect of what we call ionizing radiation is that they produce certain chemicals in the body, uh, or should call it particle or molecule uh, disturbances that then really act through water and oxygen to create radicals that then hurt the DNA. Now, it's a complex topic, but basically DNA is the information carrier of our, all our cells as we know. Uh, if you damage DNA sufficiently, a cell should normally decide to die whether or not it decides to. Normal cells, when they experience DNA damage, should stop to repair themselves. Uh, they use a cell cycle rest mechanisms, things that keep them in check from doing too much growth. That's why we have fingers, nails, these very specialized uh, different types of cells in our body. Uh, cancer cells don't do that so well. They make oftentimes a Faustian deal, or they like to oversimplify, where they turn off a lot of these repair mechanisms. So if you inflict enough of these DNA damage events, they'll keep trying to slip through them and ideally die off. And that's an oversimplified approach to the radio biology of why radiation is therapeutic. The time scale of these effects are very quick. So one of the first questions people ask is, if I get radiation, am I radioactive afterwards? No. Uh, these events happen in far less than one second, essentially. They produce these ions, they interact with DNA, they produce damage, and the effect is set in. Leave, you're not radioactive, nothing left in your body in that regard. The biological effects occur, of course, occur over the course of hours, weeks, years, depending on what dose you're talking about, what organ you're treating. So as I mentioned, the infliction of damage to the DNA is what allows us to produce therapeutic effect, toxicity, cancer production itself. We're rightly afraid of radiation in the environmental or occupational space because we know that radiation produces cancers in the cell. There's basically these over, it's again over some fine, there are three pathways that DNA damage by radiation can take once it hits your cells. You produce these double strand breaks. If you repair them, like normal cells should, on a daily basis we have radiation damage in the sun. Uh, and you have cell survival, normal behavior. If you have radiation more than you should, say you're, you have a large population of survivors from the atomic bomb explosions in Japan, you say for many years, and that if you don't repair themselves well, there's mutations or integrate the genome, you can actually form cancers in themselves. Finally, if you have sufficient DNA damage, you did in a focal area at a high enough dose, uh, and these events are not repaired sufficiently, the cells should die. And this is what we're really looking at. Maximizing this in the cancer cells, maximizing this in normal cells, and really is trying to minimize this risk, though this is a set in risk of any radiation in the body anytime you get it. So, what is the history of therapeutic radiation? Well, in 1895, uh, Ronkin, uh, a scientist in Europe, uh, basically discovered x rays. Uh, at that time, there was no FDA, there was no real, uh, say, cautionary method of all these trials we're talking about now. And so, the first thing he did a month later was x ray his wife's hand. So and that's the first x-ray photograph we have, and I hope that wasn't a bad outcome, <laughs> but she has a claim to fame that her hand was used forever in every single radiation oncology historical talk like this. A month later, they basically tried to look at a knife in some guy's spine um, using x-rays. They said, oh, this could be helpful from diagnostic purposes. Uh, then an Austrian surgeon decides to radiate a mole wasn't quite the visionary we were hoping for early on, but soon afterwards, a medical student here in Chicago, actually in the States, in Chicago, probably treated the first cancer with radiation. At that time, there was no chemotherapy. Surgeries were very toxic. There was no anesthesia, there was no antibiotics. 
So even breast cancers were just left to fungate many times. And so he saw these breast cancer patients. He said, can I just use radiation on this? It seems to burn things in the skin and heal over afterwards. And it actually helped palliate a number of patients. So I look back on him and say, what the heck did I do in med school? Not a lot compared to these guys who made a whole specialty. <laughs> so no, first Nobel Prize that this actually went to Ronkin for this discovery, allowing for all these uh, tomfoolery events in the meantime. And a year later, uh, after that, the first mycosis fungoides uh, patient was through the x-rays. So one of the first effective therapeutic uses of radiation was cutaneous lymphoma, and specifically mycosis fungoides. And I'll tell you why in a little bit. It has to do with basically, at that time, you can only really deliver radiation superficially, whereas getting the deep organs is much tougher. So the effectiveness of radiation on the skin has not really changed in many, many decades, over 100 years, you could say, because as soon as we found x-rays, we found that hurts the skin, it also, cure, it also clears lymphomas. So at that time, you had the translation of a discovery into medical science or application within months, whereas nowadays you take years and a billion dollars. Back then it just took crazy medical students and maybe uh, Rogan's wife to help demonstrate the effectiveness of this. So early radiation machines, um, really just these topical applications, these cathode tubes. This is the first linear accelerated on the left out of Stanford. Um, it, for deep targets, like I just mentioned, you couldn't get deep enough because you didn't have the high enough energies. You create too much skin burn trying to get to the deeper targets. Um, and so they would even put radium needles inside people. And we also found out from that time there's a whole generation of dentists and radiation oncologists whose hands basically have cancers now because they were using these needles. We don't do that anymore. But again, the big problem was getting to these deep targets. So over the next last hundred years, there's been lots and lots of progress. There's these modern linear accelerators, which some of you may have seen when you get total skin electron radiation or other types of radiation. You walk into big vaults. There's a huge machine that turns around you on a table. This is a linear accelerator that accelerates electrons uh, to the wave guide, along the wave guide to a target, and the interactions that are occurring at that point produce electro radiation ionizing energies. And those are focused down through very complex machinery in this part of the machine as to your part of the body. And they can get very, very accurate and very, very precise in these parts of the body. You need them to be. We still preserve superficial radiotherapy units. This actually itself has not changed in 50, 60 years. Advanced your plastic, uh, plastic uh, on top of it and better ways of, of knowing how much radiation you're giving and collimating it on the skin. Um, we use this a lot here. Uh, we have a superficial radiation unit. Topical brachytherapies also apply. You can actually put uh, a plastic piece on top of the skin where you want to treat. A uh, little radioactive seeds go back and forth along these wires inside. And the amount of time it's over that piece of skin basically treats in the mouth. We don't really prefer that for cutaneous lymphomas because, as I'll mention, one of the principles of treating gently for cutaneous lymphomas is to do little bits of radiation over long periods of time, where the breakthrough therapy delivers more dose than you probably want for many of these cases in a short amount of time. In the future, we have these huge carbon ions that are being built here. It costs hundreds of millions of dollars. UT Southwestern. None of this is really applicable to cutaneous lymphomas, though, because it's so much easier. Target is the skin. So for all these fancy technologies, you can deliver 256 beams to the center of a brain tumor. That's all nice, but what's what the skin's a target and what are the problems of the, the, the systemic involvements? Okay. So for the skin, at least, before there was Silicon Valley or any of these other uh, discoveries in the Bay Area, uh, probably one of the most important contributions Stanford made was actually total skin electron radiation therapy. They also invented the linear accelerator, so they were really a hotbed of advancement in cancer treatments, radiation oncology, and lymphoma of the skin. So this fundamental technique has not changed. It's a little dance we all do on the stand that basically exposes the skin in a very homogenous manner, this sheet of electron radiation that's totally in the skin, and going to basically a few millimeters deep in terms of therapeutic dose. The various shielding we can use depending on what dose we're going to, the eyes, the hands. Uh, generally speaking, the eyes are the main thing to shield nowadays because we're going to lower and lower doses. We understand better and better that radiation's role is but a subset of the overall armatorium of the treatments. But this has not changed in 50 years. Probably thousands and tens of thousands of people have done this weird dance and uh, you know, look back at us and laugh, I'm sure, in a few hundred years. That's what we were doing. Um, so, focal radiation therapy, we're not treating the whole skin. As I mentioned, there are superficial radiation units that treat just topical areas. Very nice for people who have just focal problems, focal tumors that are causing issues are transformed to more aggressive disease, or we're not trying to treat the whole body, we just treat that focal area. And a lot of times they'll start with just low doses, trial of two, two treatments even, effective in about 50 to 60% of cases. 
the other patients, I bring them back to what the heart it is. But it's a nice little, very low toxicity treatment and very easy to kind of see and treat. Um, it's just great from my perspective comparing the other tumor to treat inside the body where you can all this imaging and all this kind of technology. You don't know what's going on for years with these things. Electron beam radiation. I've been talking about electron beams, ionizing radiation. The majority of radiation used in therapeutic radiation oncology are photons. They go through the body at certain depths we want to go to and deliver a dose there. Electrons are charged particles, so they don't transit through the body as quickly because as soon as they interact with their charged particles, they deliver a dose more quickly. Because of that, electrons are preferred for skin dose or very low energy superficial x-rays. They both do the same trick. The, the key is to have interactions right at the skin. Skin brachytherapy I mentioned earlier, that's where you put basically these seeds right on top of the skin. It can be effective in very focal early stage disease, but again, I don't quite prefer it because the key here is to minimize toxicity and maximize benefit. I think by and large, you get equal efficacy here as here, but perhaps less toxicity in most cases, especially in the beat up skin we sometimes see in contains lymphomas. So the efficacy, it's, it's very good. Lymphomas are actually very radio sensitive diseases. Uh, they melt away quickly. Uh, the doses we use are oftentimes one third or even less of the other, radio, uh, other disease sites we treat in the body. The responses are very good. However, there are two main limitations. In lymphomas in general, the issue of duration of your response is an important topic. That's dictated by the systemic, what is the root or cell that's going to repopulate everywhere you just clean down, okay? Um, secondly, uh, there's a maximum dose that every part of the body can get, there's radiation including the skin. So you don't want to use your, your, your treatment too early when there are other treatments you use because you're going to burn this bridge way too early in the disease course uh, when you should save it for later. So a lot of times we're really always thinking about when to use the radiation. When is Dr. Wickless going to put the ball in the tea for me and I'm just going to sit in my office and the computer in the meantime. Um, so as I mentioned, the first step is really deciding on whether to use radiation and when to use it. And anytime I see a patient, especially if they've not been to Dr. Wickless, I immediately send her an email saying, you know, I want to make sure this is actually what they're saying it is, especially if it's an outside pathology read in a small town in the middle of nowhere. You know, you got to do clinical pathologic correlation. A lot of times the pathology will tell you, oh, so it's aggressive lymphoma or something else. And you just don't believe it if you see the patient, they don't manifest those symptoms. So the history is important. And having someone experience who trusts their assessment, super, super important. I always have them see you after with us if they have not seen you already. Uh, as you know, I'm saying, I father you all the time. No, but, uh, that's great. <laughs> but it's, it's good. It's I love good. it. Um, so... No other cancer do I have, you know, even in systemic lymphomas, which I also treat, it is not the same level it relies upon pathologists, dermatopathologists specifically, and the, and the oncologic dermatologists. Other important questions there is the benign process and limits, is it indolent or is it aggressive? Um, is it a primary cutaneous lymphoma or is it a secondary lymphoma? These are critical questions which, again, uh, I try to answer with the help of my colleagues. So, as Dr. Wickless mentioned, cutaneous B cell lymphomas are rare in the Western world or in general. Uh, these are more typically indolent histologies. Uh, definitive dose of this truly is a small focal lesion. You can treat it with low dose effectively, and you're done with it. Surgical excision is also reasonable, other therapy is also reasonable, but radiation, by and large, for these kind of things, is very well tolerated and gets rid of it without any cuts or that kind of thing. If this is advanced disease, it's in a problematic area of the body, just the salary glands, which are very sensitive to radiation, you don't have to say it was all or nothing. Hit lightly off that tee, go low dose first. If you clear it, you're done. If you don't clear it, then you kind of come back and fill up the less the dose. So that way, generally speaking, about two thirds of my patients get away with a low dose, one third will need a little more dose. And that way you can also uh, balance out, well, if it's riding the salary gland, maybe you should take it out surgically. Maybe you can spare the gland otherwise. So, you know, having these options available and discussing it's a whole the right thing to do. Uh, the more aggressive stalities, again, I'm gonna, those are very rare. Uh, you also have to differentiate the secondary ball and the primary. I'm not going to go too much into those because of that. Uh, but, you know, again, the, the, the role of radiation has to be dictated by where it is it's lying in the overall continuum of therapies for that person's disease. Uh, cutaneous T cell lymphomas are the primary purpose of radiation in cutaneous lymphoma. The majority of conditions, mycosis fungi is being the most common type. Um, and so, historically, before all these systemic therapies existed, there's been a lot of drugs in, lab in recent years, and just more importantly, better understanding of the heterogeneity and natural history of what happens. When you first see disease, the first person diagnosed it uh, back in the old days, your temptation was to say, let's do the therapy that seems to these responses. It must be good, right? 
just because the disease is coming back in the skin, just because your treatment made it go away, doesn't mean it's more effective. There are very high profile randomized trials that show at least one that doing a very aggressive upfront radiation therapy, long course, really stripping your own skin off, doing chemotherapy even with it, that was no more effective than doing more conservative topical therapies because it's a long natural history for many of the diseases. You want to save these techniques for later on so you may not be altering, you may feel good that you've cleared the disease, but you may not have altered survival or progression at all. All you've done is burn your option for later. So currently, we go lower doses and try to save radiation for later. It's really those rare, you know, stage 1A focal lesions that, you, yes, you can treat with radiation, but then again, you're not doing whole skin radiation for them anyhow. So this is, you know, just a demonstration that you have this kind of disease, you can get very good clearances, lots of drugs to do this kind of thing. Radiation is also effective. I think of radiation as a targeted drug in itself. It targets the DNA, per se. Um, so it's always effective, I think, in the majority of lymphomas with the response rate, even if it's, it's been resistant to chemotherapy other agents. That's, again, why it may be best safe for later in many cases. Again, another patient having a good response, sometimes more durable than others. But again, the, you got to know what are the factors deciding how long your remission will be before you dive into that kind of toxic treatment. So I'm not sure what's going on. Oh, I did not want all these animations. That's what happens when you steal a supply from a mentor. So it's kind of putting, uh, basically putting radiation into the continuum of therapies for mycosis fungoides. Uh, early on, focal radiation therapy can be good. In the broad intermediate areas where relapsing disease, no other options, or, or options are more toxic than perhaps total skin radiation, you can do total skin at that time point. Later on, if you really have advanced disease, you really have to balance focal therapy, total skin, with what is the purpose of radiation there? Are you trying to get a temporary clearance of the disease while we get another drug on board? Um, are you trying to roll that into a transplant because it can be used more recently, uh, say still semi-investigational, but uh, for people going to transplants, if you want to clear the skin, sometimes we will do total skin electron radiation. Um, but again, just finding where you are and the other therapies that are available for that patient are important. Oops. What is the effect of radiation on the skin? Well, skin has various layers. Uh, there's the superficial layers, which, you know, I'm not a dermatologist, so things are much more binary to me. They're superficial, deep. Uh, from radiation side effects, they come in dif they, the different parts of skin they're affecting will have an early side effects, meaning that the top layer comes off earlier, has sort of burning, uh, sunburn type appearance, you know, uh, sensitivity. Uh, those come in the short term. Longer term effects are mediated by these deeper structures, the, buff, the vessels, the substance fat, the sweat glands, the hair follicles go down deeper, uh, and those can come off later and take a long time to come back or recover, and also maybe become more permanent. Lower doses avoid a lot of these more permanent late side effects, um, but they can still happen, especially in mycosis from going to skin, because it's so beat up by the disease itself in prior treatments. So again, temp the main thing here is just go slow if the skin's really tender, uh, low doses, we have that portion. We have, we have now the benefit of looking back on a lot of data and knowing we don't have these aggressive before. Uh, the effects of the radiation may be delayed. The treatment response may not occur for a few weeks, but these side effects may also not occur for a few weeks. So I always tell people saying, so, oh, I did well, with, I did great with radiation. I was like, I'll see you in two weeks because you're about to have the worst phase after you finish. Um, don't plan a trip to the Bahamas, right? <laughs> uh, uh, hair loss can occur. Uh, most often temporary at lower doses can be permanent. Only in the area of treatment, of course, you're getting total skin electron radiation, you will lose that hair. It should come back, it may come back different, as I've heard from many patients. Um, and, and, and that's just something, unfortunately, part of the process. Uh, if you go to higher doses, the fingernails, toenails may stop growing for a while. It may take months before they really grow back, maybe more brittle, it's different than before. Another reason why we like lower doses is you avoid a lot of these side effects. And perspiration, this doesn't seem like a big deal. On a hot day outside, you'll get flushed if you those sweat glands aren't, aren't keeping up with what you used to be. So for all these reasons, we like to keep the doses low and only use total skin electron radiation when we really need to, or if you're really going to get a durable remission. Those are two uh, two uh, scenarios. Severe long-term side effects are rare, um, but they can occur. Uh, you know, like bone marrow depletion, things like that, just don't happen with total skin electrons. Uh, but mainly, it's more the brittle the brittle nature of the skin. That, Feeling beat up and fatigue can take some time to, to recover from. So, takeaways radiation is another tool in the treatment of patients with lymphomas. With the benefit of history and more recent advances, we know that it should be 
place to get a continuum of therapies as opposed to the only thing early on. Uh, the optimal use is really rare in a focal disease, but hopefully no problematic lesions and more advanced disease. Uh, or a clearance of widespread uh, disease where you just can't get a control of what's going on. You're losing control of the disease, kind of getting away from us with the current topical therapies and stemming agents. We just need some time to clear out the skin. Very effective for that. Uh, low initial dose trials are, are, are reasonable in most of these cases. Uh, you don't lose anything by that. Uh, you can always come back later if you need to. And the future directions are interesting. I think as more drugs come out, we know how to maybe combine them with radiation. Um, particularly with immunotherapies, which we're talking about actually, about a couple of different ideas, but they're all investigational. Um, but uh, it's, it's a combination of transplant options that also, also has been used. Uh, but primarily right now, those will be considered investigational. So North Texas options, I think most places when people ask, well, what radiation is available where? Every practice is going to have a focal radiation therapy like electron beam treatments. Maybe they don't have superficial x-rays, which is my preference here. Frankly, where I trained most Kettering, they didn't have superficial unit forever, and they did just fine as a world leading center in, in that treatment. Um, so most places can take care of most problems. Total skin electron radiation therapy, typically only at tertiary centers. We might have a trial for that. That travel grant would be very helpful for it. I didn't know about that. I'll tell my patients about it in front of out of town. Um, just you need a bigger ball, more logistics, and uh, so you may have to travel for that if you're not near one. Um, and that's that's essentially it. I want to thank everyone for coming and listening to me and Dr. Whitless for warmly welcoming to the group. Uh, and thank you for welcoming me today. Um, thank you. That was great. We don't often have the opportunity to hear about radiation stuff, experience radiation oncology. So this is really a special treat. And you're really lucky to have a great radiation oncologist to work with the team here um, because it is, well, as I said, I've had a lot of radiation. I, I have a wonderful radiation oncologist that I've worked with over the course of my nearly 25 years of living with this disease. And I, I, it's a therapy that I think very highly of, and it's not really available. We don't have a lot of radiation oncologists um, who know about cutaneous lymphomas. So, and one of the other really cool things, when our research report comes out, we one of our Clarion's grant recipients was one of the uh, physicists at Stanford who was doing a doing research in total skin electron beam and trying to understand how the radiation hits the body when you do all these funky, you know, things that you have to stand in different positions. And it was really fascinating because. Um, He's a really smart guy. He, like, he looks like he's 12, but he's brilliant. And what they needed to buy a special camera to measure the radiation from the machine into where it hits the body. And so you know, the camera was like $20,000 or something ridiculous. But they needed the camera in order to be able to measure, to capture the radiation, and then they could see how it hit the body so that going forward, when you do full body uh, radiation therapy, they'll have a better sense of which areas aren't getting as much or which areas are maybe getting too much. And then they can work on how to deliver it or how to cover areas and so forth. So like, there's all these really cool little areas in our, our world that need to be researched. And so I'm really proud that we were able to help facilitate that research. And, you know, it's very complicated, but I think it's amazing. So thank you very much. So we're going to have a break. There's still some snacks out there. Grab some coffee. The restrooms are kind of a couple blocks down <laughs> from here. And then we'll come back um, at about a uh, quarter of, give or take, when we're ready. And, uh, Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> you can put those in the bathroom though and leave them alone. So. <laughs>